Hi, Kathy. Hi, Lindsay. It's so <laughs> great to meet you. Nice to meet you too. My guest today is Kathy Curtis. She is an author and expressing writing guide whose programs help people process their emotions, improve their mental health, and access their spiritual strength during times of grief, illness, or other major stressors in life. Her guidance brings people gently through difficult and confusing times. And I'm so excited to speak with her today because I think that she can give a little healing to all of us um, because we're all going through this pandemic and 2020 was really um, a challenging year for all of us. So um, Kathy has led expressive programs for 30 years addressing specific emotional, physical, and personal challenges. And she understands how to set the stage for personal breakthroughs that help people move forward with more peace and understanding. So hi, Kathy. Welcome. Hi, Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so let's see, your journey with words has been a 30 year process. Can you tell us a little bit about how working with words took on an importance for you? I sure can. And actually, it goes back even further than that. I started working with other people 30 years ago. But, you know, my journey really started when I was a child. Um, you know, a lot of little girls get a diary to write yes, in. Yes, I did, yeah. Uh, so I really took to that because, um, you know, looking back on my childhood, I think I had a lot of anxiety and depression, mm -hmm. even when I was younger. And so I took to that outlet. I mean, I just completely took to it. Mm -hmm. And over the years, whenever I needed just an outlet for my feelings, um, I grew to really understand that the more I wrote, the better I felt, mm -hmm. the clearer I got in my head. And so, you know, over a period of a long time, that just became my way. Yeah. So um, my journey into helping other people was... Um, led just by that you mm -hmm. know by that feeling that I I had found this way to not necessarily heal that emotion but to manage it mm -hmm. to manage the anxiety but you know I'm a creative person and it was all really a natural thing for me so mm -hmm. that was kind of the way I got into it and do you think that journaling made you realize that it, there was some sort of acceptance around emotions? Um, I do. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a really good point because, you know, it, growing up in the family I did, we didn't talk to each other about anything. I mean, this is just sort of the, it was really the norm yeah. in my era of growing up. And I had a lot of emotion. I had a lot of stuff. I, <laughs> you know, I think I came into life, like wanting to understand everything. I wanted to grasp everything. But I also have a real high emotional quality about me. And so this is where I could go. And it was always safe. It was always helpful. You know, I, there were no boundaries on what it could do for me and when it could do it for me. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the way it worked for me. And so you you discovered writing through journaling and then um, you went through a pretty major event in your life uh, with the death of your mother. And you, it looks like you went back towards writing as a way to sort of ground yourself through that grief. I did. And, you know, there's a little bit of a prelude to that because, um, you know, I got a fine art degree. I, I, okay. Ironically, I went for a fine art degree rather than to pursue writing. But writing is just like, I, I breathe writing. That's just yeah. the way I am. But I'm really drawn to the arts. So I got an art degree. Art did a very similar thing for me. It was very therapeutic. And I didn't get the degree because I thought that I would be a gallery artist or whatever. I did it because I wanted to grow in that um, mm -hmm. understanding. 
So I get out of college and one of the first jobs that I had, I, I got hired to work for a nonprofit and they served women. And the, the particular things that they dealt with were domestic violence, sexual assault, addiction, heavy, heavy things. Heavy stuff, so yeah. they hired me to actually help them communicate to others what we did and to get people to donate money. And, you know, it's sort of like I was the, the PR and marketing type in that type of role. But I kept thinking, I know that I could help these women in a whole different way. Mm -hmm. But I felt like I needed a little bit of training. And so my director sent me to California, spent a weekend out there with a woman who had a very similar program for women going through domestic violence. It was like meeting my kindred spirit. She, she had oh, already, awesome. she was a little bit ahead of me on the curve, yeah. but I came back and I, I just hit the ground running and I developed a program. And the reason I bring all that up is that what I really believe about this work I do is mm -hmm. that the power of it is the combination of the creative outlets. So whether that be art or writing or whatever, and focusing it on that issue, like moving through that issue, not, not just doing art for the sake of feeling mm -hmm. good, which is, you know, right. A whole nother fine. thing. Yeah. It is. But my work is about helping people use that tool to clear what gets stuck in the body and in the mind mm -hmm. and the, the creative spirit, the creative energy is a part of why it works. So, so I go through all that. I've been doing work with all those women. I got hired by a hospital to work with um, people that had had a heart episode and they put them through rehab. I was week number five of their rehab program, teaching them to express, which many of them were, you know, middle-aged men. And so they weren't right. very good at <laughs> sharing yeah. their feelings, but then that must have been that must have come with its own challenges you know what <laughs> let me tell you I I I love that memory because here I am I'm I don't know in my late 20s early 30s I walk into a room of you know 40 uh you know 50 and older men and I'm going to lead them through a meditation and they're going to draw with crayons and I'm just thinking oh my god what have I gotten myself into Who's going to walk out first? Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> They're going to laugh me out of the room. They were like putty in my hand. Yeah, I can imagine. You know, it's one of those things that our souls need those things. And Bingo. men, men are so driven away from that from such a young boys, you know, from the exactly. time they come out. Mm -hmm. They loved it. They would have tears streaming down their oh. face while they talked to me. And I, it was a, it was an awakening for me that it was mm -hmm. truly a universal thing that people need to have an outlet and that they love being invited in to do yes. that. They love being asked to tell you what matters to them. And mm -hmm. so anyway, that was amazing. So I had done all that. I had worked with AIDS patients, cancer. I mean, you name it. I was just like a little bit everywhere. Fascinating. And my mother um, developed cancer. And between the day that she was diagnosed and the day she died was about a two and a half month period of time. And it was frantic for my family. She was young. We had no idea how to handle it. She lived two hours away from me. It was just a really frantic time. Mm -hmm. And I, after she died, I, I was like all this unexpressed stuff that I wanted to talk with her about, yeah. but she was, you know, they, they had her on morphine. She was in a lot of pain. It was just really tough to talk through that time. So you know, I had been leading other people through their issues. And mm -hmm. I thought, well, this is time, you know, for me to take my own medicine. And mm -hmm. I did. And it was, um, it was an amazing experience. And not only 
was cathartic and, and cleared all those confusing emotions and pain and all that. But then it went somewhere I didn't expect it to go, which is the spiritual connection. And that was life changing. So. Wow. Yeah, I got to tell you, I read I read that story and think I finished it in a day. Um, and I was choking back tears from start to finish. It was so you you access something through your writing. I think that you, you find that human element. You're so honest with what you were going through. I could feel it and I could feel your pain and you're sort of searching for uh, your own answers in that. And just how hard that is to, to go through that. Um, yeah. 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 It's it hard. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the thing I, I, it's so important for me to tell people you know, I did go into that. Well, I wrote letters to her because she and I had written to one another in life. That mm -hmm. was our way. And mm -hmm. so when she died, it was just a really natural thing for me to continue to write to her and tell her, you know, I watched what happened for you, but you don't know what your journey was like for me. And I want you to know you're my mom. I want you to yeah. know. Yeah. And so it was, um, it was quite a while after I finished what I thought was, I was done. And I just kept feeling like, no, you're not. <laughs> no, you're not <laughs> done. <laughs> and finally, if you remember in the book, the story about my friend who saw the hawk flying over the hearse going from yes. the funeral home. Following the, you. Yes. So yeah. I, I was really just feeling like, what is it that I need to write? Why, why do I feel like I'm not done yet? So I'm out on my back patio under an umbrella table, writing in my journal, what, what is this like? Why can't I just shake it off? Mm -hmm. Well, a hawk landed on my back fence and eyeballed me. Like it was, I oh my God. <gasps> all over my body. And I went, yeah, I have them now. <laughs> <laughs> so I, but I still didn't get it. The, like yeah. two or three days later, I'm back out there. I'm writing again. Well, what, 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 what? The hawk, I don't know if it's the same one. It felt like it Yeah. flew into the backyard. And when it flapped its wings, I felt that air on my arm. Like I, I, it was, it was just a very stunning moment. And I went, does my mom want to write back to me? Is that what this is about? So I, wow. that's what I, that's what I followed. I followed that hunch. I felt really crazy. I didn't know for sure how to go about it because I didn't yeah. want this to be me talking on her behalf I really wanted to hear from her so in the end I feel I did and that that was the healing element of my journey through mm -hmm. grief was allowing her to write back yeah so the book sort of has this conversation between you two where you tell her mom this is what I was witnessing this is what I was going through and and you have questions for her and she kind of comes back to you with honey, this is what I was going through. And I loved that um, because you, you knew your mom and you heard your mom somehow and uh, you accessed that. Right. And there was a quote that I loved too. You said, it's surprising what you can hear in the silence of a relationship with someone who has passed. And you, you reach a, somehow a new level of connection with your mom, even when she wasn't there, right? I do. I did. I did. Yeah. And it happened through the writing. There came a point where I didn't need to write it anymore. That, that connection is very vibrant and very alive. So I took that public, the, the story, but also the program that I developed because I thought, you know, what if other people can go through the same thing I did? What if they mm -hmm. can get the same healing I have? Yeah. And across the board, they have. They're yeah. making that connection. They're finding a way to have, you know, you have to develop a new kind of relationship with people that have died, but mm -hmm. you can. Mm -hmm. 
And you said you felt crazy when you started to do it. Do you find that uh, the students that you have have trouble have trouble opening up in a way where they think that they're being ridiculous or, or. Well, I will tell you a couple things. This, this was back in 2007. So 13 years ago, Mm -hmm. our ability to talk about death and spirituality has evolved a whole bunch in that time. But, but the other thing that I found, because I was like, oh, God, people are going to think I'm crazy when I come in to do this workshop. They were, it was just like the men in the heart program. Mm -hmm. They were hungry. Yeah. And to figure out what they believed and to talk about synchronicities that were happening in their lives. So it all worked out. But Yeah. yeah, I have a hunch we're all hungry for that. There's not enough of that for any of us. Yeah, I um, think you're right. Yeah. And so you're, you're, can you tell me an, a, a little bit about the writing courses that you do? Well, I have done a, a wide range of them. I have um, a couple of them are available online. And one of them is the grief and loss program. Mm-hmm. And then the other program is uh, healing through haiku. Mm-hmm. And um but I have led programs where people that have physical illnesses come in and I teach them how to listen to their bodies in the same way I teach people how to listen to their loved ones that have died. There is a way and, and there's a lot of meaning in what happens in our bodies. And the way I think about it is that every experience we have gets recorded Mm-hmm. You know, so I if you go that. through a yeah. trauma, mm-hmm. your trauma might be recorded in your stomach or in your shoulders or in, you know, it's hard to know where that emotion gets lodged, but yeah. writing is like an invitation for it to come back out of the body. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I've had people with really confusing illnesses, like I had a woman that had Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. And to her, it was just devastating and negative. It was a life ending experience. She was miserable. And in the end, what she learned was that she was being given an opportunity to become strong and powerful in a whole different way in her life. So Mm -hmm. it didn't heal her body it healed her psyche Mm -hmm. and her body communicated that to her. And she knew that she was, I mean, she knew that it was true. Mm -hmm. That's one of the programs that I've done, but um, I don't know. I just have an endless array of, of ideas and ways to help people um, get in touch with themselves and express and, um, It makes me think because there is a physicality to the emotions we feel, you know, your stomach turns if you're nervous or if all all sorts of things, if you're sad. Um, And it makes me think of uh, similarly in yoga or things like that, when you stretch to a new degree physically, um, I've heard stories of people breaking down in tears in a yoga class and it's accessing a lot of yoga teachers will say that you're releasing things that have been stored in your body that your body's been carrying that stuff I Um, totally agree with that and and I feel the same way about yoga I've had you know I relate the flexibility of my body to the flexibility of my mind Mm -hmm. there's no there's no distinction between the two you know I can quickly talk about the grief and and what I'll say about that you know I published the book that you read and it Mm -hmm. just my letters to my mom and her letters back well now that I've taken so many people through my writing program Mm -hmm. I'm coming out with a second edition of the book in which I put the writing prompts in the back of the book because what I've learned is that people really react well to being asked particular things about their grief not the normal sort of, how are you today? You doing okay? Yeah. But actual pieces of the journey that 
maybe they've never talked about. And so I have a series of prompts in the back of the book with a lot of guidance on how to just create the right environment to be able mm -hmm. to do that kind of writing and make that connection with your loved ones. So that's coming. Okay. Yeah, the Haiku <laughs> program. I've offered it live with groups. And what I find really interesting is that without promoting it in any particular way, I get a lot of people who come in that have a lot of grief, even if it isn't about people dying, they're mm -hmm. carrying a lot of grief and they really love this outlet mm -hmm. <laughs> for their emotions. So, you know, for people who don't know what haiku is, it's, it's Japanese, it started in the 17th century as a reaction to the kind of really elaborate and long poetry forms that were available at the time. Haiku is a three line poem. There are a certain number of syllables in each line. And the point is to, is to nail one simple thing. Mm -hmm. So when you live in a very chaotic world, like we do, uh, being yeah. able to focus on the beauty of a flower, the color of the sun coming up, the dream that you awaken with in the morning that leaves you feeling what, what is it? What do I feel? Mm -hmm. Like there's just some really great um, expression that can come out of that and, and forcing it into that format. It gives you structure while it allows you to get to the heart of it, get to the mm -hmm. heart of the matter. It makes me think of all of these beautiful parts of life that we disregard. And I'm seeing that with my daughter. Children are so good for that. She's almost three years old. And I, I say often when we're on hikes or something, there's no destination for her. This is, she's, she's enjoying the journey. So telling her to hurry up on the hike is totally meaningless because she's stopping and enjoying the sticks and she's stopping and enjoying the leaves. And, <laughs> like and it, yeah. yeah, all the adults are frustrated, but it's, I think it, it makes me think of what you're speaking about with haikus because watching a sunset and, and taking that as something worth examining and illuminating uh, the petals of a rose, you know, those are things that we naturally are drawn toward. But in our fast society, we're so programmed to just go, okay, I, yeah, that's pretty, but I got to go. I got to go. We can watch the sunset for five minutes, you know? I, I, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And so it may a, be, you know, go ahead. Go, oh, just that you're, with your haikus, I think you're tapping into not only healing, but also this need for all of us to to um absorb life in an in a more in a deeper way i agree mm -hmm. i had a woman i can't help but think about her she had just retired from a very big career like high level kind of career and all of a sudden she's home every day with her husband who she hasn't really had a lot of time with through the years and she finds that she doesn't really like him and that she, he, she's not happy. And yeah, she, I think this is a common experience. In the I, it could very well be. So <laughs> yeah. I, she, she didn't know how to deal with all of that. And she came to the haiku program and she said, I just learned more about myself in four weeks than I have in my 65 year life. That's the power of it. Mm -hmm. It goes right to the heart of things that we gloss over were too busy. Totally. I'm sure she was totally yeah. busy in her life. So we're on right. autopilot. You know, we eat our breakfast, we go to work, we just, and so yeah. much of that is. Um, yeah, we put, we bury things under yeah, the Yeah, burying your feelings while you're trying to just cope with life. Um, right. So it's, you're someone who is, you know, we walk into your home or whatever wherever your car says your world and someone is saying here open your eyes and experience what you're feeling and experience what you're living yeah, yeah. and yeah. that you know doing that I think a lot of people 
we have grew up because we have shoved our feelings under the carpet. They're afraid of their feelings. They mm -hmm. think, they think pain is going to kill them. They think, mm -hmm. you know, all these emotions are going to make life harder for them if they feel them. But in fact, when you do it through a creative outlet, like writing or like art, the, it, it, it's sort of the gentlest way that you can become in tune with who you are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you I can it. see that. And yeah, what you said, again, makes me think of seeing children develop and what we're doing to society on a larger level um, with emotions and what you said about people um, being afraid of their emotions. I, I read something that really struck a chord with me with raising a baby and a toddler because they have, they have breakdowns, their brains aren't as developed. So they cry a lot for kind of minuscule things, right? And the reaction that adults have towards that is so interesting to watch because some people are so uncomfortable with the idea of crying. And so it, the reaction is stop crying, just stop crying, calm down, or um, to distract them to away from feeling that emotion. And um, I someone had mentioned that crying actually is what makes you feel better. And so what's wrong with crying? We feel better after we cry. It's releasing, I think, oxytocin. Um, and and you, f it's, you feel it when you cry, you feel better afterwards. So you why would do. you discourage? Yeah. Why would you discourage a child from healing themselves? Ultimately, that's what they're doing. Right. Um, yeah. That's such a good point. Yeah. Well, and I know that they've, you know, they've been able to determine that writing also releases those kind of chemicals in your brain. So when you're mm -hmm. going through grief and a lot of people, the level of anxiety people feel in grief is, is sky high. Suddenly their life makes no sense. They have, yeah. you know, the rug is pulled out from under their feet and they wake up in the night and they're, they're anxious and they're in pain. And if they'll sit down and write and just write what they feel, it's just like the little child crying. They mm -hmm. come through it. They get beyond it. It doesn't change the circumstance. It changes right. how they feel and are able to manage it. Right. It's, yeah, I, I, it's incredible that it has that power uh, somehow, somehow processing it. And just seeing it from another, almost like a, not an out-of-body experience, but you're seeing it from another angle where you're talking about your life, I guess. Right. Yeah, I would agree with that. In fact, that kind of, you know, I've been on a long journey through this. Like I, I knew as a little, you know, a child and then a teenager that these things were really helping me. And so I've been observing me all mm -hmm. along and observing how other people live and act and, and behave. And I, I just have a voracious appetite for anything that has to do with being human. Um, so the journey of reconnecting with my mom's spirit, did not know that's where I was going when I started writing to her. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I wanted it, but I didn't know that it, I could actually make that happen. But what I've learned as I've continued to just do what I do, witness how it works for other people, what it's doing for me, is that I've come to see that our creative energy and our spirit are really one and the same thing. Mm -hmm. And so when you were talking about coming at things from a, a different perspective, maybe even a higher one, yeah. that's what I think writing and art and music and all the creative arts they elevate you they mm -hmm. elevate you out of just sort of this normal everyday way that you have of being in the world yeah and maybe offer guidance to ourselves oh they yes that's something oh yeah. absolutely your higher self this is the way to get to it mm -hmm. this is the way to know what the greatest version of you has to offer. Wow. 
Uh, I guess everybody's going to be journaling after this. I hope. <laughs> I hope. Um, let's see. And just so you feel like you've witnessed the healing process through through helping people on the journey of writing. You feel like you've seen them sort of come out on another side, right? I have. Yeah, mm-hmm. I have in a, in a million different ways. I mean, when I think about the grief programs that I've offered, you know, people walk in on week one and I, I'm always amazed at how many people show up you know, when they know that they're going to be writing letters, when they know that I'm going to have them write a letter from their loved one back, like people, like I said, people are more drawn to that than we know, Mm -hmm. but they come in on week one and their, you know, their body language is kind of curled in and they're under a cloud and they're a little bit afraid. I can tell, I mean, I Mm -hmm. know how that felt. Yeah. And by the end of that evening, there is a light shining, like there's a whole different energy around the group. And by the time they leave four weeks later, we typically meet once a week for a month. By the time they walk out the door, it's like they're walking on air. You know, they have, they have shifted into a new place. And mm-hmm. many of them have said, you know, I've been going to a grief support group for five years. I got in one month so much more. It's like a tool that they can take with them and do on their own behalf when they need it. And that's what I love is showing people how it's not difficult and it's a natural part of you. So let's teach you how to do it. And then you can be better in your own life because of it. Mm -hmm. I like how you say, uh, putting pen to paper is an invitation from yourself to come inside for a bit. That's, that kind of is what you're saying. And, um, basically, yeah. Yeah. Wait, you know, to know yourself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. To know yourself. Yeah. There used to be a lot of just negativity around that idea of Mm -hmm. getting to know yourself. I've had many people in my life say, Oh my gosh, you know, take, you know, lighten up. Well, get over know. yourself. Oh, yeah, get over yeah. yourself. Are you what that are interesting? You yeah. Name amazing and and but you know, <laughs> to have the kind of inner strength and self awareness to be able to live a healthy and inspired life on Earth, I mm-hmm. think is what it's all about. I believe you. Yeah. I, I feel that energy vibrating from you and it's, I, I want to enter that world <laughs> <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> um, because you also say that taking pen to paper can give us a, a profound sense of peace. And I see that sort of that, the speaking of energy vibration and sort of that radiating, we bring that with us. We bring our energy of the day to other people. And I okay. feel it from other people and other people feel it from me. And so if we can heal ourselves, we are doing good for the world, I think. Because, yeah. 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 Do you have any personal experience you've witnessed that are particularly interesting um, that showed you the healing power of haikus? Yeah, this is really different. I got hired around the same time that I met with the men in the hospital. So, you know, 30-ish, I got hired in a pretty high level job with a corporation Mm -hmm. and they had a leadership team of which I became a new member and they were, they were all the same basic demographic, you know, 50 to 60 white men. um, And they wanted to do a retreat for the leadership team, take them off site and developed, you know, just like team building. Mm -hmm. So the man who hired me knew about my, my work, you know, on the side with doing these creativity programs. He's like, you know, I really want you to, to lead this effort. And I'm like, Oh my God, I can't believe he asked me to do that. And again, (laughs) I had the same fear, like they're going to laugh me out of the room, but I did a similar program where I led them through a meditation. I gave them all crayons and paper and I asked them to draw their favorite childhood memory. 
And I said, you know, obviously a lot of you in here are not artists. You stick people, it doesn't matter. It's the share what this memory and, and try to convey that emotion on the paper. Well, you could have dropped, I mean, you could have heard a feather drop in the room. It was silent. People were, you know, all these men around the table are just coloring and coloring and coloring. <laughs> So it's, you know, the way I do my programs is I, I invite people to share if they want to. I never make them. Not one. I was of wondering them. about that. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. I don't like to put people on the spot and mm -hmm. I. It's so personal. It is. And yeah. you know, there could be things that they wouldn't want to share. Every single one of them shared. Every, oh. like multiple <laughs> men there, this man, and I just loved him. He was probably about ready to retire at that time. Mm -hmm. He had, he drew a picture of himself in a baseball uniform. His dad came to the game. They, his team won the game and the pride he felt from his dad when his dad, you know, came, he's like, I, I just will never forget how proud that made me, you know, to have my dad shower me with such, you know, I just, it was just like a real moment and tears mm -hmm. were running down his face. And so, mm -hmm. I mean, to me that, that man never would have told a story like that. He never would have taken the time to dig in and really we experienced that moment, mm -hmm. but I know he took that forward with him. Yeah. He when just one of my favorite people at work. Oh. So, yeah. And when are we really given that opportunity? Like you say, yeah. the invitation, right? Not, right. not over coffee at a cafe, really, you know? No, no, but no, yeah. I mean, we're not. And you know, that brings up to me a good point. When I am going through anything, and I, don't, I mean anything, but it's really bothering me and I need to mm -hmm. like clear the air. And, and what, I, what I find on the paper is so different than what I have here. You know, if you were to ask me to verbalize it, I guarantee what I would tell you would be very different than what would come out on the paper. Yes, yeah, that is interesting. Yeah, it's like the other sort of the spiritual element some yep. higher level of accessing. Yeah. yeah. Um, you also wrote another book related to processing grief with your best childhood friend. I right? did. I and did. that's out in print already. It is. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Leave your light on. Right. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that book and what that's about? Sure. Um, so my friend and I met when we were 12 mm -hmm. and just instantly became best friends. And she moved out to California to, because her, her childhood dream was to work at Disney, mm -hmm. where she did. She moved out there, got a job there and actually met and married um, an animator who ended up becoming the director of the movie Frozen and Frozen mm -hmm. 2. They have a just a wonderful life in California. Talk so about I, manifesting. I just want yeah, to say. Talk about, exactly. <laughs> she's, she's, she's definitely, you know, there's nothing that woman can't do. I mean, or wouldn't try to do. Yeah. But what happened is that her, a month before Frozen came out to the world in 2013, her 23 year old son who had been through nine months of grueling cancer treatment and he got beyond it and he was flying into his life was killed on a highway at night and um car accident so it, she kept a journal for a long time during his cancer you know after he died through the grief and she decided to, to publish it because what they learned about their son that they really never fully knew is that the kid had a light that was shining brightly in the world and people that didn't even know him were changed by him. And so um, she needed help putting the story together and came to me and it was after I had written my own book and after I had done all that work, mm -hmm. for, you know, with grief. Right. And so 
the the power of the story to me for for me personally is how life prepared me to help my best friend do what she needed to do in the deepest and darkest moment of her life and it felt amazing to me to be able to do that but Ryder Buck is his name and he's the uh, I mean, I have a connection with him too. Um, yeah. I saw yeah. pictures of him with his guitar and yeah, I, and I listened a bit to um, an episode of another podcast where you're speaking with your friend uh -huh. um, and she said something about working with you. Um, she said she collapsed into your comfort and I loved that. And you can really sense how important you were to her in, in her life through, through writing and, and helping her heal. Um, and Ryder seemed like you can see his light with that guitar and so handsome and saying to his mom, oh, I'm a, this is my chick magnet. And oh, um, exactly. right? <laughs> yeah, he, he's a character. I mean, he was wise beyond his years and an amazing guy and he could be really aggravating too i mean he was the gamut but yeah. that light was all that you know i mean mm -hmm. when we have when we allow our light to shine in life it isn't just the good parts that shine it's yeah. all of it you know but he didn't <laughs> worry about it he did not worry about it and i think that's what was so different about him is that he just was like you know yep that's who i am Mm hmm. And he wanted to be a musician. Mm -hmm. And so he wrote a song called Leave Your Light On. In so fact, that was the first song he ever wrote um, was Leave Your Light On. And he ended up becoming um, they had quite a following in the L.A. area. He had a band mm -hmm. and that's what was going so well for him. Just, you know, months after finishing treatment, he's out in the world, he's making everything happened that he wanted to have happen and then you know yeah yeah and his two brothers then recorded the song for him is that what happened or is it his voice that's it it depends on which album you go to okay. but the leave your light on um if it writer did his own recording not in a professional studio but everything they could get from his computer after he died, they, they took in and they had it professionally mixed. And then his band and his brothers recorded music that um, Ryder had not been able to get to mm -hmm. before he died. So it's a mix. But one of his okay. brothers sounds just like him. So kind of weird. Mm. But Yeah. Very sweet. Mm -hmm. Um. And you have, is this, you mentioned the ebook that you're coming out with, with the prompts for people to, to access their grief. And, uh -huh. um, and you're also coming out with another book where you're speaking with people who have been hospitalized. Yes, that one. it's, that is, and in fact, the grief book will be print and ebook. So when it's available, I'll be announcing it on my, on my, um, my website mm -hmm. but the other book this is really this is one of the places that my journey in life has taken me and you know I got hired in a hospital to be a healing artist and because I'm a writer I brought well, a lot of people did art people did music they didn't have a writer and they wanted to see what I could do with words to help people in a hospital to you know basically forget where they were for a little bit, forget about whatever pain or fear they were in and do something creative. So I had been um, on this, doing that for maybe a month or two and I just hadn't quite found my groove yet. I was trying to get people to write poetry and haiku yeah. and, and a lot of people are really, they're, they, they, don't, they don't feel well mm -hmm. and they don't feel all that creative, but um, so some of them would turn me away and I was like, oh, darn, I couldn't help them. But one day I walked into a room and there was a woman, um, probably about 45 or 50. 
And she told me almost as soon as I came in the room, I have one week to live. Wow. So she's frail, she's pale. She, when I walked in, I, I will never forget just the, the sort of vacant look on her face mm. and there's nobody in the room with her, no TV on. And I, and I was just like, oh my God, oh my God, how do I, you know, how do I bring something important to this woman right here, right now? Mm-hmm. She clearly doesn't have the energy to, to offer a lot. So out of nowhere, I just said, you know, if I asked you what one word is the most important word in your mind right now, what would it be? And she told me, and I said, well, I'm a calligrapher. I do art. I make art out of words. So if I drew that for you, would you like me to do that? She said, oh, yes. So, so I, I just had a tablet and crayons and I'm, I'm making the word and something happened. And it was like this bubble formed around us and, and we were, in this really sacred place and she just relaxed completely just watching me do this drawing Mm. so I get done with it and she said would you hang that on the wall at the foot of my bed I want to be able to look at it and of course I did and there was just something different in her on her face when I left and I'm like wow I wonder wonder if that would work for anybody else Well, 1,500 people later, that's how well it worked. Oh, my God. Nobody ever turned me down. And something so magical came out of that just sort of random idea that came about in a moment when I just needed it to happen. But the stories that came out of that are, are everything from beautiful to poignant to hilarious to oh my god everything and so I've collected um I just put a collection of them together and I'm going to show the art that I did of that word and then mm-hmm. just share the story of it so that'll be the, oh I love that so step. much yeah that's so powerful and it yeah you I can imagine you give them something important to focus on and to hold on to Mm -hmm. and it came from them it's the way I began to think of it it's like word medicine and it was Mm -hmm. they told me what they needed yeah a doctor didn't tell me they did yeah and ironically I imagine when we're in that place it's so so profound and it's such a questioning time that we're probably wondering ourselves, what should I be thinking? What should I be focusing on? So to have someone come in and give us, again, invite us with an opportunity um, to sort of hone in on something. I think that's great. Yeah. Um, Okay. So I don't think I had you tell me any of your favorite haikus, if you wanted to share a haiku. (laughs) Sure. Well, you know, the I want to say about the haiku, my, I have a good friend and I moved away for one of the corporate jobs that I took, I moved away and mm-hmm. we were emailing each other and she said, you know, what would you think about writing a haiku every day and just emailing them to each other? Like I'll write one, you write one, we'll, we'll do that just to stay in touch. Mm-hmm. Like, I like that idea. Yeah. I had heard of haiku. I knew the basic, you know, structure of it, Mm -hmm. but I had never written one. And so I literally have written a haiku every day since 2007. Like that, I do it the first thing in the morning. I wake up and I, I find it real. I just feel like I can't go into my day without it because it puts me in touch. Mm-hmm. And it helps me name one thing about my life that day. And, you know, out of thousands, I've probably written 50 that I think are really good. <laughs> the rest of that's them, the you way, know. That's, the, that's way the way of way art, I think. Yeah, it is. It is. <laughs> but one of the first haikus and, you know, the, uh, the Japanese man Kobayashi Issa mm-hmm. is a 
was a master haikuist. This is the one that caught my attention and I, I read it all the time. But it is, is in this world, we walk on the roof of hell gazing at flowers. Mm. It's just like turns your mind upside down. Mm -hmm. In this world, we walk on the roof of hell gazing at flowers. And through reading that so many times, do you get do you get um, something out of it that's different sometimes? Or does it mean just, the same thing to you each time? I think it just gives me a rush because mm -hmm. I love I love the perspective that allowed him to say that. You know, to see the roof of hell being the earth upon which we walk mm -hmm. and the beauty that grows. So it's just, you know, it's a statement about the duality of life. Mm -hmm. you know? Totally, yeah. But then I have one I wrote that I like okay. a lot. The hands on the clock wave at us as time goes by, slipping through our fingers. Mm. I illustrated and that one. It's just, it's just a way of capturing. And sometimes, you know, just capturing this one thing, it's like, wow, time is flying by. Mm -hmm. And then thinking of clocks and thinking of, time rushing through our fingers it's like they all kind of came together for me and it just made me happy to write it <laughs> you know that's really it it just yeah. makes me happy to find a um just to find a way to in three lines say something profound mm -hmm. and check in with yourself about something which seems inaccessible in a way time is time is such a strange phenomenon i feel Right. It's so slowly going forward and just the speed of light looking back. Yeah. Yeah. I had a, I just thought of a story about a woman who had, her husband had uh, died and about for like a year after he died, she had this horrible pain in her shoulders. It got so bad. She couldn't even go to work anymore. She had to take a leave from her job and what she figured out is that she was trying to carry him on her back. So she didn't mm. have to move on in her life without him. Mm -hmm. And once she identified that through writing, through words, she could, she could bring him in mm -hmm. to her heart and, and take him with her forward. But until then, it was just this horrible pain. And that's why I think that these stories get embedded in our bodies and the words that we write allow them you know, yeah. to come free. Out of it. Yeah. And did you write about that in your blog? I feel like I, I, I may have. Yeah, okay. I may have. That's okay. a really amazing story. And, and there are so many like that, just people that um, figure out even like where they're holding their grief in their body. When mm -hmm. they write about that, they, they may find that it's the same place where their loved one who died had a, a problem, you know, maybe the cancer was right there and they're wow, walking yeah. through life feeling the pain right there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Empathy on another level. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so you, you also have a blog and an online presence. So where can people find you? Well, I'm at Kathy Curtis Inc. and okay. it's I N K. Um, everything that my life is about flows from my pen, <laughs> so <laughs> that ink is kind of the important part of me. And um, I'm also my my online programs are on Daily Om, mm -hmm. and I um, they're becoming a lot more popular now. I think they're they're quite large, but you can sign up. Um, for programs that come to you via email. Um, and then, yeah, Facebook. I mean, I'm- uh, You're reachable. I'm reachable. Yeah. Okay. Um, so to finish off, uh, I just wanted to read something that you wrote. I think this is in the book. 
or maybe this is on your blog. I'm not sure where I read this. Oh, it's in your blog. Um, and you speak about actively looking for creating the experience of peace and that we all know how to do that for ourselves. And you say, we stockpile hope every time we shut off the noise for a while and give ourselves a moment of peace. When we take a walk through the woods and let nature hold our hands. When we sit at our table and create something that has never existed before. When we see someone needing a helping hand at the grocery store and offer our assistance. In a million little ways, we know just where to go and what to do to diffuse the bombs and experience the power of peace. Yeah, I, I just... I see you as a healer and I hope that many people reach out to you and in so doing access that peace within themselves and start to make this world better for all of us. Well, thank you. I, I feel like you just did that. You know, you're, I, I love what, um, what you're all about and I'm thank excited you. to know that you're out there oh. you know, sharing people with the world that you know, each of us have a, a unique thing to do in life. And mm -hmm. um, there's just nothing more rewarding than finding it and knowing it and following it all the way. Yes, I agree. Um, so I will just repeat where people can find you. Um, so any of you who think that you want a little more peace in your life this is a great way to get started go get yourself a journal start where Kathy started put pen to paper um, go inside yourself for a bit and then when you feel ready reach out to Kathy visit her at kathycurtisinc.com read her blog read her books and sign up for one of her classes and um Go, go a little bit deeper and find out where you can take yourself. <laughs> Lovely. Thank you so much.